worthy are you, Lord, to be honor and praise for eternity. For your blood has ransomed me. Glory, Lord, belong to thee. My home you made and welcome me. shall be just and true are all your ways Lord I want to give you praise I love to gather with the saints singing all in one accord glory to the Lamb who reigns worthy This morning is part two of God's will or our will. Which one do we really want? And so I want to go back to Romans 12 just to remind us of the beauties that are there that God calls us to understand what His wills are. That we would be aware that the Bible is filled with examples of prayer, filled with instructions of how we are to pray. The Apostle John tells us that if we pray His will, we have what we ask. James instructs us that if we lack what we need, that we're to pray by faith, believing that You supply what we need, and that when we don't receive what we pray, James also tells us it's because we pray with divided hearts, with shifting hearts, not really trusting and resting in You. And so Paul instructs the church with these words from Romans 12, beginning in verse 1. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Turn your Bibles to Jeremiah 41. And we need to be reminded that as we read our Bibles, God teaches us through the negative And God teaches us through the positive. He teaches us through the negative, meaning He shows us examples of rebellion. He shows us examples of what it means to commit treason against a holy God and then instructs the church to do the opposite. He also gives us instructions by telling us what is true, what is right, what is good, and then commands us to walk in these things. And so this morning, as we walk through the book of Jeremiah, as we look at this section of Scripture, we're going to see negative hearts. We're going to see rebellious hearts. We're going to see hearts that desire to do what they want and not what God wants. As we read these things, we can have two responses. We can read them and say, well, I'm not Israel. I'm not these people. I'm in a a different place in a different time. This doesn't apply to me and just push it away. Or we can understand that this is a gift from God showing us how not to walk, showing us how not to treat Him, showing us how not to act in His presence. Beloved, if we are to walk in a way that is pleasing to God, then we must understand that every single second of every single day is lived before His eyes. We live our lives in His presence. We live our lives before the presence of a great and glorious King. So what will we do? Will we live lives fearing man, fearing the world, fearing the devil, fearing that we'll fail? Or will we live lives living in fear of the Lord? Not a fear that we're scared of Him, but a holy fear, a reverence and an awe, trusting and believing that He alone can work good and godly things in us and through us. God demands of us perfection. 
and none of us can do it. God demands of us perfect obedience each and every day, and none of us can do it. But God promises to give us what we need because Christ has accomplished what we need. In Christ, God provides for us everything that we need for life and godliness. Therefore, when we fail, therefore when we sin, therefore when we don't obey, we can never blame God But we must fall on our face and repent for not trusting Him, for not crying out for Him to provide what we need. It's not enough to see promises that He'll promise to do what He promises to do. The Bible also teaches us that when we see His promises, we are to trust them, we are to lean on them, we are to believe them, and then we are to cry out for those things to be done in our lives. It's not enough to believe truth is truth. We also have to desire it to be actually functioning in our lives. We have to pray that God would cause our minds to love truth and hate error. We have to pray to God that God would teach us and train us in the way that we should go because that's where we want to be. Beloved, if we don't desire to walk where God wants us to walk, we'll never walk there. If we don't desire to love and obey His law, we won't walk there. There is a correlation between the desires of our heart and what we do. When we desire the things of the world, when we lust after the things of the world, we shouldn't be surprised that we walk and look like the world. God commands His children to desire and love what is good and to hate what is evil. Do we do that? Do we, on a daily basis, cry out for God to work in us the things that we desperately need Him to work in us? And do we cry out and pray for God to work out of us those worldly and fleshly things that we still desire to do and even love to do sometimes? And so let's pick up in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 41, beginning in verse 17. We're going to read a lengthy passage because I want us to see everything in context so that we can cry out rightly to God that we wouldn't reflect this type of attitude, but that we would be His faithful children desiring His will to be done in our lives. Chapter 41, verse 17. And they went and stayed at Gerith, Chimham, near Bethlehem, intending to go to Egypt because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them. Two things that we need to point out here so that we don't miss what God is saying in the words of Jeremiah. The Israelites were intending to go to Egypt, and he tells us because or for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. Those are two things they should never do. I want to read a few passages of Scripture because God had instructed the Israelites never to return to Egypt, never to trust in Egypt, and to not live in the fear of men, but to live in the fear of God. From Exodus chapter 20, you don't have to turn there, I just want to read a few short passages. God says, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. For them to be in fear of other men, for them to be in fear of man rather than God, they're now desiring to go back to a place that God has set them free from. In other words, they were in bondage in Egypt and couldn't get out. They couldn't earn their way out. They couldn't fight their way out. They were trapped under the slavery of an evil nation. God had provided them safe haven in Egypt. God had sent Joseph there to to work and to be God's representative and to do certain things so that many lives would be saved. But then there was a time where Pharaoh forgot who they were, forgot whose children they were, and treated them badly. And they cried out for God to save them from this nation. And yet now, they're intending to go back to Egypt. Intending to go back to the people that treated them cruelly rather than trusting and believing in God. From Deuteronomy, we hear these words from Moses. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, 
and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. From the prophet Isaiah, we hear these words, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, and rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and horsemen because they are strong. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. And Jeremiah later on says these words, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel said, behold, I am bringing punishment upon Ammon of Thesbis and Pharaoh and Egypt and her gods and her kings upon Pharaoh and those who trust in him. Throughout the, the history of Israel, God instructed them never to return again to the place of Israel. Never to trust in their power. It sounds silly today to think that Israel, that Israel was forbidden to go to Egypt, but we must understand why God is saying this. They were the powerhouse of the world, and yet they pale in comparison to the sovereignty of God. So for Israel to go back to Egypt as a place of safety, for Israel to go back to Egypt to receive horses and horsemen and power to defend themselves is actually saying, Lord, you can't help us. We need someone who's more powerful. And again, we think those words are strange and odd, and maybe we'd even say, oh, I'd never do that. But we do, don't we? We go to things and to people and to, 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 to other objects and think they can encourage us. We think that they can provide the comfort or the strength that we might need. And in reality, we're saying, God, you, you can't help me here. You, you don't know my woes. You, you, you don't understand what's going on in my life or my heart or my mind. And we live often in the fear of man rather than living in the fear of God. What's the barometer that God gives us to tell us that we're living in the fear of God. Thankfulness, praise, obedience, and not the fear of man. Every time we have a fear of man, it's because we're not living in the fear of God. Every time we feel our heart being pulled back because we're afraid of people, one person, many people, a nation, that should remind us that we're not walking by faith and we're not trusting God. Because if the God we worship is the sovereign God of all the universe and He rules over every nation, then don't we take comfort that He's in control and not us and certainly not them? See, we live in a time where there is much affliction coming for the church. We live at a time where there's many words of threatenings towards those who would trust and believe in the Bible or who believe in absolute truth who actually still think that sin is sin. But we must not fear them. We must fear the Lord. So let's read that section again and, and continue in our passage with, with that understanding that we read from those four other passages. So they were intending to go to Egypt because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them because Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, had struck down Gedaliah, the son of Achim, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. Then all the commanders of the forces, and Johanan, the son of Kareah, and Jezaniah, the son of Hosiah, and all the people from the least to the greatest came near and said to Jeremiah the prophet, let our plea for mercy come before you and pray to the Lord your God for us, for all this remnant, because we are left but a few. As your eyes see us, that the Lord your God may show us the way we should go and the thing that we should do. 
If we read just that passage from verse 2 and verse 3, it sounds very religious, doesn't it? It sounds like they actually desire the Lord to do something. Let's continue as we look with that in our mind. Verse 4, Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray to the Lord your God according to your request, and whatever the Lord answers you, I will tell you. I will keep nothing back from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, May the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act according to all the word with which the Lord your God sends you to us. Whether it is good or bad, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we are sending you, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. If you take verse 2 and 3 and verse 5 and 6 and read those alone, does that not sound like somebody who's faithful to God? Does that not sound like a group of people who truly desire the will of the Lord? And the answer has to be yes. Those are right words, but guess what? Are they words that please the Lord? And the answer is no. Because their heart, just like Jesus said to the Pharisees, with your lips... You say you love me, but your heart is far from me. And we will see that as we look through the rest of this passage. They were giving lip service to Jeremiah. They were giving lip service to the Lord. And what they wanted the Lord to do was to bless the plans they made already. We already read that they were intending to go to Egypt and they were running away because of fear of men. Again, it's not what we say just that matters but it's what we say and by what we mean by them and what we actually desire. See, God knows the intentions of the heart. God knows what the attitude of the heart is. So when we go to the Lord in prayer and we lift up flowery words, we lift up words that we're supposed to say, but our heart isn't actually desiring God to be the king and ruler of our life, that we actually really don't want God to lead us in His way, we just want the Lord to bless us in our way, God knows these things. These are acts of rebellion that flow from a, from a heart who at that moment is being very hypocritical. Very, very much the hypocrite. See, God's not fooled by these things. God's not fooled when we sing songs that speak truth, but in our heart we're like, dude, when will this be over? Really, we gotta sing four songs? We gotta sing again? See, our heart matters. What we're thinking when we're singing, what we're thinking when we're praying matters to the Lord. They were not really seeking the Lord's prophet to rightly understand God's will for their lives as we will see that it unfolds. See, we should go to the Lord's prophets in Scripture to understand what He's already said. And we should go to brothers and sisters in the faith to receive godly counsel. But if we don't really desire it, God's not fooled. Pick it up in verse 7. At the end of ten days, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. So think about it. Jeremiah says, I'll go to the Lord and I'll pray to the Lord and I'll ask Him to reveal His will for your life. And I think by the testimony here that Jeremiah is faithfully praying for ten days. Ten days he's crying out on behalf of of the Israelites. Then he summoned Johanan, the son of Korah, and all the commanders of the forces who were with them, and all the people from the least to the greatest, and said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your plea for mercy before Him. We have to be very careful when we read God's Word, because when God makes conditional promises, He means them to be conditional. When He makes condition and says, if you do this, then I will do this. But if you don't do this, then it's going to be something very, very different. And this is exactly how He answers the people of Israel. Verse 10, If you will remain in this land... So the first words that God speaks to these people is, I know your heart. I know that you're intending to go to Egypt, but my first thing that I'm going to speak to you, if you will remain in this land, 
In other words, change your plans to be my plans. Then I will build you up and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I relent of the disaster that I did to you. Do not fear the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Do not fear him, declares the Lord. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. See, isn't this what God promises? Not only to save us in Christ, not only to forgive us of our sins, but actually to be our Lord and our Savior and our King and our Ruler. To protect us from this world. And when the world does prevail over us and take our life, it's because God ordained it to be. Because that's the day He's calling us home. None of the world can touch us. The devil can't touch us unless God gives them permission. Does that bring us comfort? So God begins to speak by touching on the things that they were doing wrong. Stay in the land. Don't go to Egypt. Don't fear people, but fear me. I will grant you, verse 12, I will grant you mercy that He may have mercy on you and let you remain in your land. In other words, God's promising to so turn the king of Babylon's heart that instead of crushing them, He'll actually show mercy to them so they can remain in the land. Verse 13 is the shift. But if... So in other words, verses 10-12 through 12 are a blessing that God will do upon their obedience to His Word. And then verse 13 is a shift. But if you say, we will not remain in this land, disobeying the voice of the Lord your God, and saying, no, we will go to the land of Egypt where we shall not see war or hear the sound of the trumpet or be hungry for bread and we will dwell there. Do you hear what they're saying? Do you hear what God is pressing upon them? He says, if you stay here, I'll bless you, I'll care for you, I'll protect you, I'll provide you, and I'll even turn the kings that hate you to show mercy to you. But if you leave, and if you go to Egypt thinking there you'll find peace, there you'll find comfort, there you'll find safety, and there you'll find food, then hear the word of the Lord, verse 15. Then hear the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if you set your faces to enter Egypt and to go live there, then the sword you fear shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine of which you are afraid shall follow close after you to Egypt, and there you shall die. All the men... All the men who set their faces to go to Egypt to live there shall die by the sword, shall die by famine, and shall die by pestilence. They shall have no remnant or survivor from the disaster that I will bring upon them. Do you see the two options? God says, obey me and be blessed. Obey me and I will conquer your enemies. Obey me and I will provide for you. But disobey me, and everything that you fear will fall upon your head. And not only will it fall upon your head in partial, it'll fall on your head in totality. And he says, all the men that desire to take these people down there, I will destroy every single one of them, and there will not be one remnant. Oh, God is mean. Oh, he's nasty. Really? Isn't he loving and caring to actually reveal his will to them? See, when we, when we hear the world complain that God is a mean and angry God, that God's wrath is unfair and hell is unfair and judgment is unfair, how can something be unfair when God says, if you do this, I will do that, and if you do this, I will do that? God is not a God who hides. God is not a God who hides His will. God is a God who reveals Himself, who reveals His truth, who reveals His laws, and also reveals the consequences for breaking those laws. Did He not tell Adam and Eve that the moment that you disobey, the moment that you eat of this tree, you will surely die? And then the serpent comes in and says, well, God didn't really mean that, and He, he really certainly didn't mean that you will surely die. Did He? And he convinces 
Adam and Eve to ignore God, to listen to the snake. Why? Because the snake was more pleasing to their fleshly heart. See, if we're just looking for counsel that scratches our back, that itches our ears, that allows us to do what we want to do, then go to the world. Go for fleshly counsel, go for worldly counsel, and they'll just tell you exactly what you want to hear. Because one of the anthems that worldly counsel provides is, you know, you just got to be happy. And whatever makes you happy, go and do. I've heard counselors counsel that people should commit adultery, that they should leave their spouse, that they should commit sin. If that makes you happy, then you should do it. And I've even heard Christian counselors say that if sin makes you happy, then God wants you to be happy. And committing sin pales in comparison to God wanting you to be happy. Does God want us to be happy in that way? And the answer is certainly no. God wants us to be holy. And if we're holy, then we will be happy. But we'll be happy because we're reflecting the one that we are being conformed to. If the goal of the Christian life is to be conformed into the image of Christ, then walking in holiness, walking in righteousness is the only way for us to experience true joy, true happiness. But if we want to find happiness in the world, if we want to find happiness in sin, then you'll be able to find someone who'll give you permission to do that. But it will never be God, and it will never be a believer who's being faithful to His Word. And this is the danger, beloved. There is Christianity, which is of God, and there is a worldly Christianity, the broad road that leads to destruction, that speaks for the flesh, that speaks for the world, that echoes the sinful desires of the flesh and leads many people astray every single day. It's why the Bible teaches us to watch out for false teachers, to watch out for false prophets, false Christs, false pastors, false messages, because it's dangerous for our soul. Verse 18, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as my anger and my wrath were poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so my wrath will be poured out on you when you go to Egypt. You shall become an execration, a horror, a curse, and a taunt. You shall see this place no more. The Lord has said to you, O remnant of Judah, do not go to Egypt. Know for a certainty that I have warned you this day that you have gone astray at the cost of your lives. For you sent me to the Lord your God saying, pray for us to the Lord our God. And whatever the Lord our God says, declare to us and we will do it. And I have declared, and I have this day declared it to you, but you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God in anything that He sent me to tell you. Now therefore know for a certainty that you shall die by the sword, you shall die by famine, and you shall die by pestilence in the place where you desire to go to live. When Jeremiah finished speaking to all the people all the words of the Lord their God with which the Lord their God had sent to them, did their attitude change? Did their hearts change? Certainly not. See, this is the line in the sand. People can say, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, and then time after time after time, as they're instructed by the Lord, they go the opposite way. Why? Because they're a Christian in name only. They're a Christian by a, by a profession of their lips only, but not a change of heart by the power of God. Verse 2. Azura, the son of Hoshana, and Johanan, the son of Korah, and all the insolent men. You see how the shift has changed? And all the insolent men said to Jeremiah, you are telling a lie! Do you believe this happens today? Do you believe that pastors stand in pulpits and preach from the Word, and in the minds of the people they are like, this is foolishness. This, this isn't true. It happens every day. You are telling a lie. The Lord our God did not send you to say, do not go to Egypt to live there. See, the thing is, Jeremiah didn't say anything new. 
It wasn't as if Jeremiah was pulling something new out of a hat and it's completely opposite of the, what God has already instructed them in the past. No. He just repeated the words that God spoke to Moses and what God spoke to the people before. You are not to return to Egypt. God doesn't change. His will doesn't change. And yet as they hear the truth, their hearts say, this is a lie. This isn't of the Lord. And then they put the weight on someone else. Verse 3, But Barak, the son of Neri, has sent you against us to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans that they may kill us or take us into exile in Babylon. Isn't that amazing? That Barak was actually used of God. That as Jeremiah would speak the vision, speak the words that God had spoke to him, he would be the one that would write things down. He was the penman that was used of God to write the book of Jeremiah. And see, as Jeremiah speaks, they're now trying to split Jeremiah and the one that serves him and serves the Lord. Verse 4, So Jehanan and the son of of Karai and all the commanders of the forces and all the people did not obey the voice of the Lord to remain in the land of of Judah. See, God calls us at times to stand for the truth. God calls us at times to say, even if you are the only one, will you stand here for me? Will you stand for the truth that's bringing pressure on your head at work or in your home or among your friends? Will you stand there trusting that God is able to uphold you and God is able to protect you and God is there to do all that He promises. But they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't remain in Judah. They didn't trust that the Lord would bless them. But Johanan the son of Korah and all the commanders of the forces took all the remnant of Judah who had returned to live in the land of Judah from all the nations to which they had been driven, the men, the women, the children, the princesses, and every person whom uh, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had left with Gadala, the son of Akam, son of Saphan, also Jeremiah the prophet, and Baruch the son of Nerah. And they came into the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord. And they arrived at Taphanes. So what do we learn from this passage? If you keep reading in the book of Jeremiah, we do see that God brought wrath upon their heads. We see that Jeremiah is shown another vision and not only the one that they feared in the land of Judea, he also would come to Egypt. Jeremiah would see a vision that he would plant a stone in the center of a gate that leads into the nation of Egypt. And he makes a prophecy that the king of Babylon would come that he would set his chair, his throne on top of this stone, and he would destroy all that live in Egypt, including the Israelites. So, did their rebellion bring them prosperity? Did their rebellion bring them protection? Did their rebellion bring them relief from the famine that was in the land? No, it did not. Why? Because God told them that if you continue on this path of rebellion, I will destroy you. So who's sovereign? Them or the Lord? Who's in control? Them or the Lord? And what we need to understand is that this passage is a gift from God to us. In the book of Corinthians that Paul writes to the church, he gives a list of things that the Israelites did and then he sends a phrase. He says, do not do as they did and do not desire as they did which gives us the liberty to go back and look at all that they did and all that they said throughout their history and learn from them that the physical nation of Israel is not the church, but the church is to be a spiritual people that lives very different from the nation of Israel because we are the Israel of God, meaning the elect of God, meaning the people of God who are not just called out of a physical nation, but who are called out of the world and out of their sin and out of darkness and out of death and into life and into His marvelous kingdom. If we profess with our lips to be Christians, then we are also professing to be citizens of another kingdom. 
And the kingdom of God that we profess to be citizens of has superiority over every earthly kingdom around us. Our King in glory has a higher rule than all the leaders in this land. Yes, we are called to obey the leaders of the land, but when the leaders of the land call us to disobey our God, we are called to stand and say, we obey, we submit, but here we cannot obey and cannot submit because that would be to dishonor our God. See, being a Christian is not up for a vote. We can't go to God and say, well, God, our church, we took a vote and 95% of the people want to go this way. Will you bless that? That's not how the Lord works. What needs to happen as a people of God, as we gather together, we need to read our Bibles. When we see His will, we're to cry out, Lord, work Your will in us. Change our hearts from loving the flesh. Change our hearts from loving the world. Change our heart from loving sin. And work in us what's pleasing to You. That's a prayer God will answer. That's a prayer that God will answer every single time when His people cry out to Him for His will to be done. But what He will not do is be a genie in a bottle when we go to Him with our plans and our desires and say, well, I think this is the Lord's will for my life. Now, Lord, bless them. See, we have to stop praying like that. We have to stop thinking that He's just merely there to meet our needs rather than us being there to serve the King of glory with all that we are, all that we are, our physical bodies, our minds, our abilities, our talents, our goods, everything that we are and everything that we have, we are to use for the glory of the Lord. What did your mind say when we sang that line that Danny led us in? It's His breath in our lungs that we use to praise Him. Do we think of those things? Who's causing our lungs to breathe? Who's causing our blood to circulate in our body? Who's causing our body to fight off illnesses and infections? Is it modern medicine? Or is it God Almighty? God uses modern medicine sometimes as a secondary cause, but He never gives up His throne. He never gives up the throne of being the author of life, the giver and taker of life, the sustainer of life. I pray that this gift from God, this passage, these truths that we looked at, I pray that that gift by Him giving us this passage will turn us from this type of religious activities. That we wouldn't just merely seek to say the right things, but that our heart of faith would actually desire the right things. That we would truly desire to submit to wherever He would lead us. Not seeking dreams and visions and new things, but believing that He's already spoken in His Word. See, I believe that these types of passages are a gift from God to the church. Because I believe with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, that Genesis 1-1 to the end of the book of Revelation is a gift to the church. It's not a gift to the world. It's a gift to the church. And after every phrase, after every word, after every chapter, after every book, our heart should say, thus says the Lord, amen. Thus says the Lord, amen. God, God, cause my heart to love the things you love and hate the things you hate. See, that's walking in victory because we have to renew our mind. Paul wasn't joking when he said we must renew our mind. Why? Because we come into this world naturally hating the things that God loves and loving the things that God hates. That's who we naturally are. None of us in this room ever had to be taught to be wicked. We come into this world with every inclination of our heart always and continually being wicked. Do we believe that? Do we believe that when the Bible describes fallen man, that we have to say, that's me naturally? It's the only way we'll rejoice when the Bible describes those in Christ. And then we praise God by saying, I was this, but God has caused me to be this. Lord, protect me from drifting back here. Lord, protect me from yearning to walk in my old life. Protect me from desiring to be who I was. Help me to kill the old man and help me to put on Christ. See, if we're not confessing that we are who we, the Bible says we are, then we're not going to rejoice in what the Bible says that we are in Christ. There's so many people that say, oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in all that sinfulness. 
Oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe man is as wicked as the Bible said it is. Or something even more surprising. Well, yeah, men used to be that wicked, but we're not that way anymore. We've cleaned ourselves up. We've become better people. We have better laws now, and we have more technology, and we have more things that we've created, so we're better people. No, we're not. See, the Bible says, left to ourselves, all we can produce is wickedness and sin and death. But in Christ, He takes those frail, fleshly, broken, dead people and causes them to be born again causes them to love truth, to love His law, to love His ways, to love His testimonies, to love His statutes, so that our heart, like the psalmist, now cries out, Lord, I love these things. Work them in my life. Cause me to walk in the way that is pleasing to You. Cause me to see that You are the one to fear, not anyone in the world. You are the one we are to obey, and certainly not ourselves. See, when we see warnings in the Bible as gifts from God, then we realize that we need these warnings desperately. We need by faith to trust and believe in the truth. We need to be trusting and fearing in God alone. And so I want to read the passage from Romans that we read last week, starting in verse 11 and verse 33. Because when we read the instructions that God gives, and then we see the warnings that God gives, and then we see His hand that falls heavily upon sinners that wickedly and willingly disobey, do we want to walk there? Do we want to be those that willingly disobey God and then have His wrath fall upon them? Or do we want to be those that hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom that your Father has prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. See, God's grace is truly gracious and God's mercy is truly merciful. But if we think that we can live a life of rebellion and the day that we close our eyes, God will bless us, we're sadly mistaken. Because those that have been born again actually live differently than the way that we lived before we were born again. Are we talking sinless perfection? Are we talking about never disobeying again? No, we're not. But we're talking about a heart that loves righteousness, that loves holiness, and that hates sin. And when we obey, and someone says, wow, you're different now, we give all praise to God. And when we sin, we give all credit and all responsibility to ourselves. And we find ourselves repenting privately and publicly. We find ourselves telling people that that was my own wicked rebelliousness. That that wasn't the way God wanted me to live. We find ourselves not looking for excuses for what we do that are wrong. We find ourselves freely confessing. Because why? Because we fear God more than we fear man. We fear God more than we fear ourselves. And we trust that He is faithful in all His ways. And that all those that run to Christ will never be cast out. And that the living water that He promises is always there for us to drink. The living bread that is always there for us to eat, to be strengthened, is the gift that God will never take away. The Gospel is not only good news for the day that we repent and believe and get saved to get our ticket out of hell, but the Gospel is the food that Christians dine on every single day until the Lord calls us home. Not like some that teach, oh, you sinned, you got to get resaved. Oh, you sinned, you got to rededicate your life. Oh, you sinned really bad, now you got to pay God back and do something for Him. No, but a constant banner over our life that yet we are still wicked sinners. Christ is a greater Savior. And we encourage one another to press on, to trust Him, to lean on Him, to lean on His understanding, not ours, to seek His will, not ours, to trust in His wisdom, not ours. And what we'll find ourselves doing is accomplishing great and glorious things for the Lord. Not in our own strength, but in the strength that He provides. Not in our own wisdom that we concoct, but in the wisdom that He gives freely. And God will be praised. So listen to Paul and see if his words are more beautiful in the light of the wickedness that we just saw from the nation of Israel. The faithful. Think about it. Jeremiah was faithfully preaching the Word after they had already thrown him into a pit after they had already arrested him, after they had already tried to kill him, after they had already treated him shamefully. 
And he continues to remain faithful to the Lord, even after they drag him all the way to Egypt, knowing that that's not where the Lord wanted them to be. See, beloved, we can't say, well, I'm in this, this, this place in my life. I'm in this circumstance now, and God understands if I don't quite obey the way that I should. Really? Faithfulness is always commanded of God's children. Circumstances are exactly that. They're just circumstances. They don't change the will of the Lord. They don't supersede the will of the Lord. They don't change His laws. They don't change His ways. And Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How many times this week were we blown away that God's riches that are poured out on us each and every day are so immeasurable? They can't be counted. How many times this week were we blown away that God's wisdom is so much wiser than our wisdom? How many times this week were we in awe that God's knowledge is so much more than what we could ever learn or imagine? How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways? How many times were we brought to repentance because we accused God of wrongdoing in the past? How many times were we brought to repentance this week because we actually accused God of not being just or faithful or right in His ways? For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been His counselor or who has ever given Him a gift that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. Think about that. Every time God gives us a gift, He gives us a gift that is still for Him. Yes, He gives us gifts that bless us. He gives us gifts that are, that are useful to us. But those gifts that He gives us, they're merely tools for us to use for Him. God said to Abraham, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing to the nations. The American way of thinking is, well, God blesses us because He loves us and He blesses us for us and it terminates with us. Is that really the way that God wants us to walk? Certainly not. God blesses the church so that we would be a blessing to the nations, both in the church and outside the church. And then Paul says, to Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he says, so we have to forget that the chapter 12 division, the change from verse 36 to 12.1 isn't there in the letter. There's no division. So he says, from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Meaning what is commanded of you, which is the way you are to worship God on a daily basis. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Reel back to our passage. They were intending to go to Egypt. They were running away from people that they were afraid of. And yet, what does God do in His grace and mercy? If you remain in the land, if you trust Me, if you follow My Word, I will bless you. What is He doing? He's instructing sinners how to turn away from their sin to be blessed. Shouldn't we be praising God every day that He doesn't give up on us? Shouldn't we be praising God every day that when we desire to do what's wrong, He's right there instructing us to do what's right? See, when we do what's wrong, it's not only because we desire to do what's wrong, but we have to step over what we know that God has already instructed us to do right. We have to openly rebel against God to do what's wrong if we're, if we're a believer. Why? Because the Spirit dwells in us to convict us of sin. The Spirit dwells in us to lead us in the way of righteousness. And the Bible's there speaking the truth of God every single day. When you and I sin, beloved, we sin with an open hand, shaking our fist at God, and then thinking that even in our rebellion, He should bless us. God blesses the church every single day for one reason, 
And it's because of the work and person of Christ. And every time we desire to sin, He's right there saying, my beloved, turn. Don't walk that way. Don't desire those things. It will bring harm to your life. And by faith, either we say, I agree with you, God. I repent of my desires. I repent of the things that I was yearning to do in rebellion of you. And I praise you, Lord, for leading me in the truth and we walk there. Or we say, I don't care what you say. I don't want to listen. And I'm going to do what I want to do. And then we're surprised when the wheels of the bus fall off. And who's the first person we always blame? God. And then we start to blame the people of God in our life, don't we? It's the same picture from the garden. Adam was commanded. Adam, live this way. And when the wheels of the bus fall off, he says, God, it's your fault, and it's this woman you gave me's fault. Eve was commanded by her husband, was instructed in the ways of the Lord because God had commanded Adam. And what she basically said is, Adam, I don't think you're telling the truth. I think you're lying. I think I should listen to this serpent who's talking to me. I think I should do what I desire to do rather than what you told me to do. And then when God confronts her, oh, but it's this serpent you let in the garden, Lord. It's your fault for creating the serpent. It's your fault for letting him talk to me. See, every single day of our life, beloved, we are going to hear words of the world. We're going to hear lies from the devil. We're going to hear false prophecies and false teaching from false teachers and false prophets and false pastors. But the word of the Lord is going to remain constant. The word of the Lord is going to remain true. And we have to ask ourselves, do we want to walk in the ways of the flesh? Or do we want to walk by faith, by the power of the Spirit? But praise God, even when we choose to walk in the way of the flesh, He's right there to cleanse us of our sins when we cling to Him and cry out to Him. Shall we sin so grace abounds? God forbid. But may we be a praiseful people that when we sin, grace does abound. And God is faithful to His promises and He will finish what He started. The reason why Christians that are truly saved make it to the end isn't because we're good people. It's because He who began a good work in us will bring it to completion. Will we join Him and walk with Him? Will we rejoice with Him and praise Him and thank Him on the way? Or will we be that child that kicks and screams and fights against His Father and then surprised that all the wheels of the bus fall off? May we be a people who praise God often. May we be a people who are in His Word daily, learning what ugly looks like and learning what righteousness looks like. Learning and understanding that the ways of man will always lead us away from God. But the ways of God, the ways of the Father, the ways of the Son, and the ways of the Spirit will always lead us in a way of peace and truth and joy and comfort. May we truly want God's will to be done more than ours. And may we truly want our wills to be conformed to God's wills. And may God be gracious to lead us in the way of repentance, lead us in the way of holiness, and lead us in the way of truth. Let's pray. Father, forgive us for praying many times as these fleshly people pretended to desire Jeremiah to pray and pretended that they would obey whatever he spoke. Father, cause our hearts to see the difference between lies and truth. Cause our hearts to see the difference between the spirit of the world, the spirit of this age, the spirit of the devil, and the way of Your Holy Spirit. Father, help us to love Your Word. Help us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Cause us to be a people who fully and totally rely on the work of the Spirit to guide us and direct us each and every day. Help us to cling and to lean not on our own understanding, but to cling to You and Your wisdom. Help us to be a people of repentance. Help us to be a people who willingly confess their sins because we don't want the name of the Lord to be dishonored. Help us to care more about Your name being exalted than ours. Help us to be a people who care more about Your will being done than ours. But Lord, may You work in us that which is pleasing in Your sight. 
So your will becomes our will. Your desires become our desires. The things you love becomes the things we love. And the things you hate becomes the things that we hate. Lead us in the way of righteousness. Lead us away from our sinful desires. Lead us away from our fleshly desires. Lead us away from the ways of the world and away from the ways of the devil. May we be a people who can truly say, I love the Lord and I love His ways. And may we be a people who pray for His will to be done each and every day, regardless what it costs us, regardless whatever the price He asks, that even if it is unto our own life, may that be a great joy for us, as it was from all the faithful who have gone before us, who learned the lesson rightly, that everything that God asks us is worthy of the name of Jesus. There is nothing too great. There is nothing too small. May we be a people of faith. May we be a people of the Word. And may we truly desire to be renewed each and every day in the way that we think and the way that we desire so that we can live lives for the glory of our King. And all God's people said, Amen. to be honor and praise for eternity for your blood has ransomed me glory Lord belong to thee My home you made and welcome me for you O oh Lord my thanks shall be Please work in me.